<laughs> so yeah, I've actually had several people responding that, but but it's election night, so but we'll get you out of here in time for the uh, to see the first returns maybe. <laughs> Well, tonight, well, first of all, welcome, as always, to the Center for Marine Science, and especially welcome to our Luther Society members um, who make this possible. Um, and we have a real treat tonight. It's a triple header. Um, two of our premier scientists and myself will be um, talking about oysters, um, shellfish aquaculture, and coastal habitat restoration. Um, one of the things that some of you are probably familiar with, but many of you aren't, is that aquaculture, particularly shellfish, restoration of habitats of a variety of types, as well as fisheries, is a, is a large strength at UNCW. Um, for example, in the aquaculture arena, um, we have the Shellfish Research Hatchery funded by the state. It is the only uh, research hatchery of its caliber between Virginia and Florida, correct? And so it's very, very unique um, where they're um, researching on new lines of oysters um, and also working with the growers. Um, we have a fin fish aquaculture facility where we're looking at um, growing methods for a variety of species um, such as um, flounder, uh, redfish, uh, various other species. Um, once again, working extensively with growers. But, we also have extensive in the field work. For example, researchers such as Troy Offen um, are working extensively in the field um, with the methodology, the impact, uh, working on various restoration methods as well. And we have quite a few researchers doing various aspects of restoration, culture, um, fisheries habitat. Um, and so this is one of the real strengths of the general coastal marine sciences program at UNC Wilmington. Well, tonight, as I mentioned, we're going to do a bit of a tag team. Um, I'll start it off, um, talk about some general background, just a little bit of background for me. Um, I am director of the Center for Marine Science, but more importantly, um, faculty member here since 1989. Uh, my interest, research interests are in um, habitat restoration, fisheries. Uh, biology, impacts of human activities. I have served on the state's um, Crustacean Fisheries Advisory Committee, um, which later became the Crustacean and Shellfish Advisory Committee, continuously since 1995. Um, and don't seem to let me go. Um, we've all, I've also worked on a variety of other state agencies in terms of management. Um, Dr. Wilbur, is head of the Shellfish Research Hatchery. She is a well-respected, world-renowned researcher on shellfish, on their genetics or populations, and she has taken this hatchery from its first brick into a fantastic facility in terms of working with growers, breeding, um, those components. And she herself is involved in a variety of statewide um, and international national organizations looking at restoration. Troy Offen has been at UNCW since 1988, um, has worked on a variety of habitat benthic um, issues, and particularly in recent years looking at fisheries and aquaculture. He was vice president of the East Coast Shellfish Association. He has served on the Shellfish um, Advisory Committee, as well as the state's Habitat um, Advisory Committee. Um, and, worked, and is currently a representative on the Oyster Steering Committee. Um, um, organized to provide some input into restoration. So with that, we will talk a little bit about oyster and habitat restoration, challenges, unique opportunities. Okay, the um, outline for today's talk, I'll talk a little bit about a background to oysters, um, decline, renewed interest, and particularly in terms of seafood ecosystem services. Dr. Wilbur will talk about shellfish aquaculture, um, which is of growing interest and as a way of providing these services, the why and the how. And Troy Offman will talk a bit about global aquaculture, challenges, restorations, and looking forward to where we may be going. 
a little background to the, the oyster. The oyster that we culture here is the eastern oyster, oyster Chrysostra virginica. Um, this particular oyster occurs very widely along the east Gulf coast. You can see Wilmington right here, sort of in the center of its range. This is an ideal place for it. Um, it has some quirks in terms of how it grows. Um, to the north, it tends to grow subtidally. Why do you think? You, why do you think we don't get very many oysters in a nice inner tidal up north where it's cold? <coughs> Winter time, um, they get ice, you get freezing, so it tends to be subtidal. As you move into the southeastern, they're primarily intertidal in this zone, and they're mixed with the Gulf and a few other areas. They're a common estuarine organism um, in sounds, generally salinities greater than 10 parts per thousand, at least during the important larval period. And you can sort of see a nice typical group of them, um, subtidally and intertidally. So a little bit about the history of the oyster, um, its importance and its fishery along the east coast. The oyster was an extraordinarily common and dominant member of our estuarine environments at the time the Europeans first came here. Um, if you look at some of the accounts from John Smith and some of the earlier um, explorers and, and European colonists, um, they talk about just vast beds of these um, in the Chesapeake Bay, um, just dominating large, shallow, huge reefs. We see accounts from the early 1800s in North Carolina talking about the oyster rock and the live rock throughout the lower part of the Cape Fear. And they, of course, were used very extensively pre-colonially. Uh, we see this from middens. They were used extensively uh, by natives for food. But, of course, they're primarily gathered by hand um, and from accessible areas, and so their fishing pressure was relatively modest. When we began to colonize the area, they quickly became a major food source for the early colonists. And basically by the 1800s, the oyster fishery had become a staple source of protein throughout much of the near Midwest. There were actually laws in Maryland that forbade how many times you could feed um, indentured, um, you know, people they brought over kind of the indentured servant types, how often you could feed them oysters and crabs. Um, because, you know, it was considered just so common a food. A little bit of history of the fishery. Um, it was number one fishery in the United States by 1880. Number one of everything. Oyster fishery was an amazingly productive and dominant source of seafood, seafood in the, early, in the 1800s. And that was really the high point for most of it. Um, in Long, oops, in um, Long Island, New Jersey, you really had your peak, and New York, you had your peak catches in the mid-1800s. Um, Delaware Bay, you had peak catches in 1880 of 2.4 million bushels that year. Maryland, in 1884, peak catch, 15 million bushels harvested in a year. It's an amazing map. Um, North Carolina, the height was between 89 and 1908, 1.8 million bushels in 1902. Do you notice a little something about how the peaks are moving? They're going from north down to the south. Basically, as you began to deplete them closer to the population centers of the north, um, your, fish, your whole fishery is beginning to move south. So not surprisingly, this led to the next part of the saga, the decline of the oyster. By the late 1800s, early 1900s, the fishery began a noticeable decline that continued gradually into the mid-1900s and leveled off. Uh, by the mid-1900s, as you can see, the 30s to 40s, Maryland had reached a level that was only 20% of the record total, so an 80% decline. Delaware leveled off at about 42%. Most places were around 50. North Carolina was around 50% of what the peak was. But then, in the mid-1900s, uh, a dramatic decline occurred. Um, Delaware harvest dropped by 90 to 95%, leaving only 2% of the peak harvest. Maryland harvests were less than 1%. In fact, there's a huge restoration effort in Maryland. 
millions and millions of dollars that's going on right now. Its goal, its, its stretch goal, is to bring back the oyster populations to 1% of what they used to be. Gives you an idea of the decline. North Carolina, 3% original, although it's uneven. Most of that was probably in this town that goes down. A wide decline, overfishing was one reason, not surprisingly. The high harvest levels could not be sustained. This was particularly exasperated by the advent of the power dredge. Early oystering was done by going out there, grabbing it, um, using um, sailboats that had sail dredges, which really couldn't easily decimate a reef, or using tongs. Has anyone here ever used a tong? Troy's used a tong. Yeah. You use it a few times and you realize that's not how you want to make your living. I've actually used, it, used them once or twice, so that was a short tong. Um, it's, not a, it's not an easy way to do it, but with the power dredge, uh, uh, motorized boat and, motor and dredge uh, winch system, you were able to have an amazing uh, uh, efficiency in catching the oysters. And this had a direct effect of removing the oysters, reducing the reproductive population, and basically eliminating um, what was going to produce them. It also had a variety of indirect effects. There's a uh, power dredge, an early one. Um, had a variety of indirect effects as well, because it also removed the shell. Oysters are a little bit different than other fisheries because they grow on what they leave. And they have to have the oyster shell. You take out the oysters, you not only re take out the reproductive population, you also remove what they have to have to grow. So we removed that, preventing reestablishment. We also um, cut down and smoothed over the oyster reefs um, that were often mounded in the subtitle, which was important for keeping them off the bottom and um, out of low oxygen waters and enhancing recruitment. And then we had other factors that particularly came in in that 1950s. One was disease. We had dermal MSX. Um, which led to high mortality of, oyster, of oysters, probably introduced, possibly introduced. There's some discussion that perhaps this effects were particularly exasperated because of the other stresses on the oysters. We had increased turbidity and siltation because of the coastal development. Think Chesapeake Bay, Pamela goes sound to a lesser extent with farming. Um, uh, berry shells, young oyster spat, um, can't survive as they get a coating of uh, silt on inhibits feeding, it generally reduces the, the condition or kills them outright. Other reasons for decline is that oysters have a density dependent lifestyle. What do I mean by that? Oysters live with oysters. They grow on oyster shells. They grow in clumps. They spawn together. It's all one big kind of happy family. And this is important. They have a settlement that's aggregated. They settle together. The larvae key in on other oysters. They form clumps that protect them from siltation. Those clumps, they always point up, getting the oysters off the bottom and pointed into the water. It helps them escape from low oxygen. It helps them with spawning, since they're destroying gametes into the water. It also helps keep them from being eaten by predators. It's much harder for a crab to get an oyster that's part of a dense clump than a single oyster. Um, so it provides some defense as well. And it keeps them from sinking into the substrate. Water quality is another issue that led to decline. Um, low oxygen for an area such as Chesapeake Bay. So consequences of the decline. With the decline of oysters, we've lost the ecological and fisheries functions that oysters provide. They were a dominant organism with their loss. There was a very significant changes. A uh, researcher from Houston Marine Science, Roger Mann, um, did an economic analysis where he estimated that the ecosystem value of oysters was, were far more, when you think of dollars, than the actual fishery because of uh, their filtration, their habitat for other fishery species, um, their effects in um, reducing shoreline erosion. So let's talk a little bit about some of those ecosystem effects that were lost or degraded with the loss of oysters. One is habitat. Oyster reefs may be the only structural thing out there, the only thing that provides a hiding place on a flat that's otherwise just monotonous sand. 
So it's a place where you can get juvenile crabs, juvenile fish, juvenile shrimp, um, utilizing it as a place to hide from predators, as a protection place. It's also a place where predators can go and forage along the edges. Um, how critical are the hab reefs and habitat? That probably varies um, from location to location. Probably not all reefs are equal, but we do know they can be important. And there's a lot of research on some of the aspects that make them important that can affect their importance. There are also amazing filtration effects of oysters. Um, how many of you have seen this tank display where you put oysters in a tank and it clears the water? How many of you have seen this? Uh, quite, quite a few of you. They can really um, have an impact on the overlying water. There's a lot of questions that aren't answered about the effect, as you can see. How important are they on a large scale? What conditions enable them to really impact it? A lot of work is going on in a variety of places, including here. And, but they clearly do have an effect, and this is receiving a lot of attention now um, in places such as um, up north in the, uh, in the um, a river system just to the north, in some, some of the Jacksonville area, um, where they've done a lot of um, bivalve planting out, for example, to try to reduce water, increase water quality. Sturgeon City area. Um, they also can be very important in reducing erosion. Um, several people in this room I know have worked on projects where we planted oysters out on the edges of shorelines as a way of reducing the rate of erosion, um, particularly combined with planting salt marsh and the like. This actually sows some marsh with and without oysters. Um, they can be very effective. And this is receiving also increased attention for ecosystem management implications. As part of a living shoreline response, to reduce erosion um, and prevent land loss of the shoreline, um, they can be extraordinarily effective under certain conditions. And finally, the fishery, although as I've indicated before, it's now a fraction of its former level, it's still economically important for fishermen during certain times of the year. During the winter months, it may be the primary source of income for a certain fishermen, even though year long it may pale in terms of total output. Um, and it's also got a major social importance. Just part of the, the history and the social fabric of the coastal fishing communities um, is really wound up or bound up with oystering and um, that aspect of the coastal life. And while it may be partially restored, oysters for food may increasingly come from aquaculture, which may really bring back some of the, some of the abundance. So in terms of management issues, with the decline of the oysters, we've lost the functions, we've lost the oysters as food to the, um, comparatively um, to what they once were. This has led to increasing interest in restoring these functions um, as evidenced by a lot of recent initiatives in this state, North Carolina, with some of the recent legislative initiatives as well as in other areas. And it's led to increasing interest on other approaches such as aquaculture, restoration, um, and sort of broader um, management combinations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Uh, Wilbur. Thank you, and I appreciate again that you all came out to listen to us tonight. Um, I'm going to start this with a simple definition of what is aquaculture. This is the definition that is provided by the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, and I like it because it emphasizes two things that make aquaculture different from fishery, and also these two things uh, point to one of the major conflicts that aquaculture has, at least uh, as it's trying to grow and develop in the United States. These two issues are folded here. Intervention. Aquaculture means that somebody does something, that we don't just let nature produce the oysters, we have to do something to actually enhance production, which means we generally have to get out into the areas where we're doing the farming. In the case of shellfish aquaculture, that is almost exclusively in our coastal waterways. And most of you know that our coastal waterways are held in the public trust by the states. And so these are public waters. And so any form of intervention leads to a potential user conflict because somebody is doing something from to help themselves and taking it away from the public good. The second issue here, ownership, also runs into problems when we talk about um, the public waters that are held for everybody. It's really hard to own something that is being grown and supported by something that belongs to everybody. 
A similar situation exists in the West where uh, private livestock owners are allowed to graze their cattle and sheep and livestock on public lands. And it does present a user conflict in both situations. It's been very influential, I think, in retarding the development of aquaculture in the United States. The U.S. ranks 17th globally. We produced a roughly a half a million tons of aquaculture products in 2014. Uh, to put that in sort of perspective, global production was uh, 78.3 million tons of aquaculture production, with most of the, that being produced in Asia. What I think is sort of interesting about this is that we're not growing much, but we're sure eating a lot of it. <laughs> we are number one in fisheries imports. This leads to a trade deficit of $12.6 billion. And in some years, this is a, our second greatest trade deficit. What's number one? Oil. 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 Sometimes cars beat shoot seafood too, but <laughs> this is extremely uh, incredible to me. Um, what's also incredible, since I've been working in aquaculture for about a decade now, is that now about half of those imports are farm drains. This really illustrates the growth of aquaculture. That 73 uh, million tons represents about 40% of our global fisheries landings. And it is thought that in the next few years that aquaculture will actually exceed, or will produce more farms than we actually pull out of the ocean. And that's an incredible statistic. Why do I think we should farm oysters in North Carolina? I think oysters, aquaculture is a, a great industry. It is a very sustainable industry for some of the reasons that Martin was talking about. They feed low on the food chain. They provide ecosystem services. They don't uh, we use no sort of hormones or anything in the production of farm shellfish. And to be honest, they're eating exactly the same thing that the wild shellfish are, so there's really not a lot of difference between the farm race and the wild. So I think it, we have a, a tremendous opportunity here to uh, build this particular industry. If we need evidence of that, we can compare, look at this graph here, where this plot, plots the uh, value of the oyster aquaculture industry in Virginia and North Carolina starting about 2005 and going through 2014. In 2005, the two industries were equal, about a quarter million dollars a year. Over the next decade, North Carolina's industry grew. We're now about just under a half a million dollars worth of uh, oyster production. But in that same time, Virginia went from that quarter of a million to $17 million worth of farm-raised oysters in that, just that same period of time. In addition to that uh, oyster production, they also produce about $38 million worth of farm-raised clams, producing an industry of $55 million. That points to me to a tremendous ec potential economic development in the state of North Carolina. Unfortunately, we don't just lag behind Virginia. And this statistic uh, surprised me also. This is just a pie chart showing the production of oysters on the East Coast from 2013 total farm gain about 154 million. Virginia certainly is one of the big heavy hitters with Connecticut, Florida, and Massachusetts. But here's North Carolina. We, compared to the other states on the East Coast, we have the second largest coastline. Only Florida can beat us. Yet we have a, not even a percent of the market for the industry for, uh, production. Even Rhode Island beats North Carolina. And I think that's a little bit <laughs> so I think that there's a tremendous opportunity here for a growth of a what would be a very uh, green industry. So the, uh, in order to sort of talk about why what has perhaps limited the growth of the industry in North Carolina, I want to um, take it back to how we could actually go about farming oysters in North Carolina, or actually anywhere. And to do that, we need to understand how oysters um, how what the life cycle of an oyster is. Many of you are familiar with this, so I'll try not to belabor it too much. But Pisoptera virginica is considered to be an early, early summer spawner. Um, they will spawn all the way through the summer and into the fall uh, in North Carolina, but the peak production is in early in the season. A female oyster will release several million oyster eggs into the water column where they are fertilized. And um, they, those fertile egg, eggs will develop relatively quickly into a larval stage. <coughs> And then by about 24, 48 hours, depending on the temp 
the shell that is so characteristic of the adults that we know. So at this size, it's about two thousandths of an inch, they already have a shell, they already have a structure that allows them to swim up in the water column. They start to feed on phytoplankton at this place, or at this point, and over the next two to three weeks, they grow tremendously. They become about three thousandths of an inch and uh, start to exhibit a couple of features that indicate to us that the oyster is now ready to transition from swimming up in the water column to being attached on the surface where we're much more familiar with them. These two features are, you can't see in this picture, there's a little spot here we call an eye spot. And, uh, it's not, but <laughs> we call it. And this structure here is a foot. At this time, the larvae start to behave differently than they did early on. They start to drop out of the water column, they stop swimming, and crawl around on the surface. And as Martin says, they're looking for other oyster shells because that's what they preferentially uh, set on. This foot structure is a chemosensory structure, and so they can actually basically taste oyster shell. When they taste oyster shell, they secrete a little bit of cement from that same foot. They turn around and they drop their shell into it, and they're stuck. They gradually lose some of these structures, the foot and the swimming organ, and they start to change shape and become grow up into the form that we're familiar with seeing on the reefs. They can be about an inch in three to six months, depending on, on where they are. They will reach market size anywhere from 24 to 48 months, depending on, on where they are. Uh, theoretically, oysters can live for decades. Um, modern expectations are that most oysters don't live much beyond five or eight years for, because of many of the challenges that Martin <laughs> so for farming oysters, we actually divide this life cycle into three phases. The first phase is where would we get the oysters that we want to grow. And there's basically two choices. We can actually put structures out into the water during those months when the larvae are naturally setting and collect them and then bring those into our farming operation. Um, or we can actually produce them in a hatchery, which will take care of this whole entire part of the, the process. The next stage would be somewhat what we generally refer to nursery culture, which will take the oyster from being about uh, less than a quarter of an inch to about the time they are three quarters of an inch. This is referred to a nursery uh, phase. And then finally, the grow up phase takes the uh, uh, juvenile oysters all the way up to market size of about three, um, three inches. Tonight, because this is a really uh, complex process, I'm going to focus on just sort of this bottom part here where the oyster farming comes out, uh, gets out into the natural waterways, because that's where a lot of the conflict comes about, and that's one of the challenges that we will have to overcome in order to grow the industry. So why do we have to grow oysters out in the water? Why can't we grow oysters in buildings like this, with tanks and like we do fin fish? Any ideas why that might be? Mm. Not enough food. Not enough food. So if you think back to what Martin talked about, the amount of water they filter, they filter that volume of water because they need to eat that much plant material in order to grow algal material. And so we can't grow enough food in a facility to feed many oysters. And so if we're going to farm oysters with any sort of a number, any sort of scale, we're going to have to put them out in water, out in natural water, where productivity is extensive. And so that's why oyster farming almost exclusively uh, goes, takes place in our natural waterways. We have yet to really figure out the technology to be able to do it in a facility like this. There's two general strategies once you get out into the water column for growing oysters. They're not very complicated in how they work. Bottom culture takes place on the bottom. This is the traditional form of oyster aquaculture in which uh, historically you could just spread shell material down on the bottom at the right time of year and collect natural oyster set and, call, and take care of that oysters for a couple of years and then you could harvest off that. That's certainly the traditional form of bottom culture. It, um, but product, productivity can be improved by intensifying the operation. And one way in which we can intensify is that we can actually attach shell or spat to those shells before we push them off off onto the, onto the leases. So this is a shell that has little spat. These are probably about six to eight years old. And then those seeded shell, or spouting shell, can be actually pushed out on the reef. And so you know that you have oysters that are going to grow 
on those reads. Another strategy, which generally also increases the productivity that we can get out of a unit area, is to grow singles. These are oysters that are not formed in clumps like you're used to seeing them, and we produce singles and hatcheries by playing a small trick on the oyster larvae. So instead of providing, when they're making that transition, instead of providing them with whole shells, we grind the shells up into sand. So then when the larvae drops onto that bed of sand, and crawls around, that sand grain still tastes like oyster shell, so they're perfectly happy to secrete the cement and catch, but when they start to grow, they don't grow up as clumps, they grow up as individual oysters. These oysters can be uh, put in different types of uh, systems. This is called rack and bag for obvious reasons. There's bag lumps attached to racks. This is a tray system. And all of these uh, can be uh, uh, used to grow the oysters in, in a bottom situation. What defines bottom culture is anything that takes place within 18 inches of the bottom, at least in the state of North Carolina. All of these activities require that you get a lease from the state of North Carolina that is taking that area out of the public trust and granting it to you for the your use to produce oysters. And so this is that one of those points in where there's a little bit of conflict between people that want to farm oysters in a particular area, and perhaps maybe somebody wants to, to fish crabs or, or do other types of activities. The alternative strategy is to get up those oysters off, off the bottom. Why might it be beneficial to get the oysters up off the bottom? Cleaner. I guess it could be cleaner, but what else is up? What else would be abundant <coughs> at the surface of the water instead of down below? Mm -hmm. Food again. So it's all about food. <laughs> so the surface waters have a higher concentration of phytoplankton. So if we get those oysters up in the surface waters, they're going to grow faster because they have more to eat. And so that is one of the main benefits for getting up off the bottom. The strategies for getting oy growing oysters off the bat bottom are as many as there are people in this room. Um, it's extremely situational because there are uh, competing uh, meat or competing um, parts of the process. Um, one of the things that happens is that anytime you start putting gear, any of these gear, out in the water, you're going to get what you might see in this picture right here. Stuff is going to attach to that gear, much like stuff attaches to the bottom of your boats. And that requires a lot of labor to keep the gear clean. And we have to keep the gear clean and allow the water to flow through those cages to bring the food to the oysters. And so different types of gear have different uh, uh, issues associated with them. This is just a few of the different types that are used. These water, uh, these uh, getting off bottom culture requires uh, a water problem lease in addition to a bottom lease. Because not only are we um, asking for the state to free up the, the, air, the area 18 inches off the bottom, but we're actually going to use the entire water column, and that eliminates lots of use of the same area. There's no way you can drive a boat through that area. So you're excluding other activities out of these public trust waters. Market-sized oysters in, in these intensive farms grow, grow faster, one and a half years to get it to a market-sized oyster. And with a little bit of selective breeding, which is what we've been doing in the hatchery for the last few years, we think we can get that down to a year in order to get a market size oyster in a year. That makes a tremendous difference to the farmers because they've uh, getting out here in the water, natural waterways, their crop is at a great deal of risk, particularly from those things we call hurricanes. And so the quicker they can get those oysters in and out and to market, the better off they are from a, a business. I'm going to hand it off to Troy. Troy's going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that oyster aquaculture faces from a regulatory standpoint, and lots of other good stuff. Thank you. Um, not going to talk a lot about about the first unit of global aquaculture, but I but I will mention it a little bit. Um, one thing that I do want to want to talk about, and then I'll start off with saying, you know, we talked about the fact that the U.S. Uh, it is lagging behind in some of our aquaculture production. Uh, that's been pretty clear from the graphs. I'm going to show you a little bit more data, but there's another reason that I want to put that out there that we're, we're lagging behind a little bit. And I think that that is because we started out uh, trying to protect, we're a little further along the line in protecting our natural resources than some of our uh, other countries around the world might be. 
And so one of the things that, that uh, is slowing us down is that we need to resolve a few issues. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but uh, when you begin to look at how aquaculture proliferated throughout the entire world, I mean, I, the funny part is, when I stood up here and gave a similar talk 15 years ago, we were, we were wringing our hands going, oh my gosh, you know, we've got to replace, we've got to replace 30 to 40 percent of what we consume with an aquaculture product, right? Now aquaculture makes up, what, almost half of what we're consuming? What'd you say? 44. Yeah, so we've already exceeded that in that time frame, right? And part of the reason for this is, and I want you to look at whose, whose quote I've got here, right? You see that? So they saw globally and say, hey, wait a minute. This may be an industry that we can grow in some of the undeveloped or underdeveloped in areas of the world. Put a little bit of money in here and we can get a product out because guess what? We're trying to feed the rest of the world. Um, and, and yes, yes, most of that production is coming out of, out of China and Southeast Asia. Guess what? That's where we keep all the people, right? That's where the mass of the world's population is. And so that makes sense, but it also makes sense because sometimes they have uh, the water quality and the, and the areas that they can put it, and I guess I should go ahead and say this, and sometimes they're not really concerned about some of the competing uses, right? They're, they're not quite as open to having that discussion. So in some of these areas, it makes sense that we can, we can get this kind of development. I'm not sure that this is what, what we really want. Um, and, uh, and just to follow up on this, and this will be the last graph I present about, about our aquaculture products, but, but uh, this, uh, axis over here is China's production, see that, in, in thousands of metric tons, and this is where we are, way down here, right, on this axis. They're, they're, they are many times ahead of us, they're many times ahead of us. So the reality is there's, there's room for the U.S. to grow, there's a need for it to grow, and I think that there's a desire to grow aquaculture in general in our country. Uh, we're going to shift over to shellfish more specifically shortly. But I want to say at this point that it is very important that we do it the right way. That we begin to expand this industry in the right way. And we want to do that um, without creating uh, certain problems. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sure you've all seen these signs, right? You've seen the, the shellfish closure signs. And so one of the things that I, I guess I'll go ahead and tell you guys we've got to resolve is some of our water quality issues if we're going to grow shellfish aquaculture in this state and in this country, we've got to reconcile some of, our, some of our water quality issues. For the next few minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about public perceptions. And this is more specifically focused at North Carolina. Uh, and then we've got to make, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some cultural changes and some regulatory challenges um, that we've got to overcome. All right, here's the interactive part of my talk. All right came to college, you wanted to hear a talk, you got to have a quiz, right? That means I want to hear some responses. So if I say commercial fishing, what's the first thing that pops to your mind? All right, I pointed at you. You made eye contact. Sorry. <laughs> Any ideas? Commercial fishing. What do we have? Shrimp. Shrimp. What else? Tuna. Tuna. I say commercial fishing, you think tuna. What else? What else? We've got tuna, we've got shrimp. Crabs. 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 So we're, is there anything else that pops into your mind about commercial fishing? The concept of commercial fishing? Trawlers. Trawlers, factory ships. Anything else? Anybody on the back row? 20 mile long nets. 20 mile long nets. So maybe we, I was expecting somebody to say it costs a fortune to get involved in commercial fishing, right? I don't know how many, I don't know how many thousands of dollars the commercial fishing license is in North Carolina, but it's several thousand dollars. Uh, we get some of this waste products, uh, the factory ships is what we always used to think of, these massive ships out there processing our catches, right, tearing it all up. Uh, byproducts in this case would be by catch. Um, it turns out all the beach communities get really upset when little fish wash up during the summer. Uh, you know, they, they don't like that. But also we spend a lot of time talking about endangered species and regulations and how we're going to deal with that. And, and the first thing that popped into my head when I, when I took this quiz my own self was this image, right? These massive nets and all these fish. But the shellfish industry can be a little different than this, right? We've talked about, and, and by the way, 
uh, I gave a talk earlier uh, this month, and I talked I talked to the group about program inefficiency in our fishing practices. And I think this is a very important concept. We used to use gear that couldn't possibly catch it all. We have gone away from that, and we tend to use gear that catches everything. And so we, we think that was moving to a more efficient system, and in reality, uh, we, were, we were tearing the whole system apart. Um, but shell fishery, we think about this, right? We think about scrambling out here and getting a bushel of oysters. This guy's, by the way, in Florida, and he's getting a, a bushel of, of wild-caught oysters. We're thinking about that when we think in North Carolina about shellfish, uh, commercial shell fishing, but in reality, we should be thinking about this. And this is, uh, this is Joey Daniels. I lifted, is anybody from the Coastal Pen? I lifted this right off their, I shamelessly took it this afternoon, right off their website. This is Joey Daniels, and this is his upwell system, using technology uh, and innovation to be more efficient in the space that he has, right? He's trying to grow it, he's trying to do it, he's using a lot of technology. It's still just as much work, it's still just as much headache, um, but, but this is a, a thriving business and it needs to be treated like one. We need to think about these shellfish aquaculture operations as, as real businesses and as part of our, our area and our community. Um, so the guy that we saw before Joey Daniels, uh, he's producing a product that looks a lot like this. Uh, this is actually, these are South Carolina oysters, these are not North Carolina oysters. I'll go ahead and make that disclaimer. Uh, narrow, long, small clusters. Yes, they're delicious, but they are not the same as the aquaculture product that we've been talking about, which tends to be that half-shell market, that nice, pretty, teardrop-shaped oyster, the one that, that, right, the one that we want when we go to the restaurant. We want that half-shell oyster to look just like that. Well, I want mine to look like that, right? So, so that's what we want, and that's what we're willing to pay a premium for. So when we think about this, and we're thinking about balancing this. We need the wild caught. We may need the extensive culture, that is where I throw shells out, allow, allow natural set from Mother Nature to colonize the shells, and then I harvest that resource. But we also need this intensive culture as well if we're going to meet some of our demands. Now, ooh, I like this picture. This came out of an article. Uh, this is in the New York market. Uh, the newspaper article said this. I don't know, can you guys see this? Can you guys see these numbers up here? Uh, this oyster here is uh, $2 each. This one is uh, $2.25. I think that one down there is, is $1.90. And then there's a Kumamoto on the end, which is a really nice, delicious little cup-shaped oyster. Uh, that's like 3 bucks each. And so these are what we sometimes call boutique oysters. Right? These are grown in very specific water bodies, very specific farms, very specific areas. Uh, and so this is what the New York market wants. They're not buying a hundred boxes at a time. These restaurants or these markets are probably buying a few boxes of each each day. But it's a consistent market. Guess what? This is the French market. Uh, same time period. They have eight different varieties here as well as a couple of mussels and a few other things. So, so what we're seeing is that the products that we're hoping to grow out of North Carolina along the East Coast here are, are very different than what we've traditionally grown in our state. Um, so where is it coming from? Well, I don't think we're importing that much from China. I couldn't find a lot of data on, on Chinese imports. Amy, did, have you seen any of data on that for, for shellfish? And I think the reality is it's just too far to bring them here. Um, so a lot of the, the Asian countries are, are consumed, but a lot of what they're producing in many areas is, is this extensive culture. Also, although they do certainly have some intensive culture, think of that as, as anything grown in a cage. Um, but this is a much, much different uh, uh, market. Well, guess what? It's not, just, it's not just one or two places, right? Uh, if you go to Charlotte, anybody been to Charlotte? Anybody from Charlotte? Nobody's from Charlotte. Okay, so Raleigh? Go to the oyster bar there in Raleigh. I can get eight different varieties of oysters. Shuck right there for me. Any day I want, I can go right in there. We're talking about a much more sophisticated consumer. Um, we want something different. The consumers in the United States want something different. There are 24 oysters here. I'd go broke before I could try them all, but I would, I would certainly, certainly do my best, right? Uh, we are, as a, as a group, we really like our oysters. 
We like this idea that they have a brand. We like this idea that, that certain water bodies impart certain qualities to these things. And so that's something that the growers have done a great job in some areas of really cultivating and, and pushing forward. Uh, they don't need a thousand acres to make a living. They need, they need consistent products that uh, demand a good market price. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot to show this to you. So I had to say this, this $2 is not what the grower is getting for that, by the way, all right? So the grower, he'll be, he'll be lucky uh, to get probably 50 cents, 60 cents each for these. But think about that. Think about that price, 50 cents an oyster compared to we buy, we pay 50 bucks for a bushel that may have two to 300 oysters in it, right? Of all different sizes. So there's a big, big difference here. There's a lot of sweat equity that goes into producing these, um, but there is a payback at the end, right? Uh, and of course, and of course, I do have to say this, that bushel market, uh, Louisiana is leading the country currently in, in, in producing that. Uh, much of that is coming off of leases, but they dredge those up. That they, they have those massive leases. They dredge up a lot of that product. So that's more or less a, 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 a steamer type market or a shock oyster market. Although uh, we have had some folks here just recently talking to us about how Louisiana is trying to grow their, their branded oysters. Uh, turns out when you, go, when you go and look at this, West Coast produces the specialty oyster, the most specialty oysters of any place, right? Up and down the west coast, they produce tons of these guys. I was really surprised to find out that the northeast and New England area is about to eat their lunch. They are, they are coming on strong and they have a great, very strong market. So they're, they're second here. When you start looking through these, these lists of oysters, you see a lot of New England oysters growing out there, but the water's a lot colder and they tend to grow a bit slower. Um, but it is happening. So, how are we going to do this? How are we going to develop the shellfish industry? How are we going to put these things in the water? How many acres of, of shellfish aquaculture do we have in North Carolina? Do you remember? Close to 2,000 acres? Maybe 1,800. I, I was thinking closer to 18, but yeah, 1,800 acres. We, got, we have a thousand linear miles of estuarine shoreline. And we have very, very little uh, shellfish aquaculture, and mainly because it's, it's cultural differences that, where we need to make some changes. Virginia, as we heard, has done a great job of it. And this, this is actually, they, they have something called the Aquaculture Sustainability Tool. And basically it's a, uh, green means there's no conflicts, yellow means there's some conflicts, and red means there's a lot of conflicts. It doesn't mean you can't grow oysters there because I looked at their tool uh, this week and it turns out three quarters of the shellfish operations are in red areas. So they already have conflicts there. But five years ago when we were developing our siding tool, this didn't exist at that time. So, so this is something that's new and it's being done by their Department of Natural Resources. So, so we've got a lot of things to do. We've got to do a couple, couple really big things. While we're talking about aquaculture, we're talking about intensive aquaculture, we've also got to do our, our homework on restoration. We've got to figure out where we're going to restore our resources, right? Um, North Carolina can grow our, our, our aquaculture industry, but I must put this caveat in. Virginia has made some huge mistakes in, its, in the last 10 years, and we don't want to repeat those, right? We, don't want to, we want to learn from their mistakes, and we want to do it better. So we have great water quality. Uh, we have huge potential. My comment at this point is we want to proceed very, very intentionally. Um, and we've got a few, few conflicts we've got to resolve. Um, we've got to change our perspective. You know, is this all we want? Went to one of the, I, I eat oysters every chance I get. And I go into all the seafood houses every time, just a curious fella. So I go into a seafood house in July and I said, look, I'm looking for oysters. How many oysters do we have? The guy says, it's July. There's not an R in this month. Okay. All right. I said, well, why don't you? I said, you can carry them. You can get those oysters from someplace else. People won't buy them. Why won't they buy them? This month doesn't have an R. It's July. And so I'm sitting here. Does anyone else see my problem in logic here? Right? I'm not going to offer you a product to, to buy. Now, if I, I jumped in my car, go visit my wife's aunt and uncle. They're in Charlotte. I go to the oyster bar in Charlotte. 
Nobody told me, nobody gave me a spelling lesson on the month, right? I ordered my oysters, they showed up, no problem. So we've got to overcome this. We, This R month thing is something unique to us in the coast. We've got, we've got to get rid of that, right? I am not saying do away, do away with your, with your uh, bushels of steaming oysters. That's great. When it gets cold like it is today, I would love to step outside and see a fire and some oysters. Unfortunately, we won't be doing that. Um, but the aquaculture industry can produce these year-round, and, and there's a place for it as well. Other uses. We've got to understand that we can still have other uses within our water bodies. We can still have our fishing. We can still have our boating. Uh, and we can still have other activities that we may do in the estuarine environments uh, as, long as, we, as long as we manage this properly, right? Um, and we have to cope with regulatory restrictions. Uh, I made this comment to somebody not long ago, is that if you go to North Carolina statutes and look at how many state laws that the legislatures have put in place for uh, governing oyster or bottom leases, there's almost six pages of statutes. Anytime you see that much legislation, it means that the state is having trouble making some decisions. There's four lines of statute that actually establish the Shellfish Sanitation Department. Four whole lines, and they've never changed it. It was good enough. But when it comes to, to shellfish leases, we're really having a lot of trouble, and Dr. River pointed it out. It is that public trust issue that we're having trouble getting our brains around. We, we don't know what exactly to do with that. So we've got we've to come up with a way to handle it. The other thing we've got to do is while we're siting our aquaculture operations, we've got to figure out where we're going to restore oysters. No deposit, no return ought to be what you think when you see oyster shells, right? You've got to figure out where you're going to do it. Again, 15 years ago, we were going, yeah, maybe it would be good to do some restoration, blah, blah, blah. Now we're desperate. We are absolutely desperate to get our oyster resources restored for all the ecosystem services that we talked about earlier, guess what we're short of? Shells. You know where they are? They're all in the roadbeds because we didn't understand back in the day. Uh, and so we, we don't have, and, and by the way, North Carolina is not a one size fits all. So our management strategies have to be stratified for our water bodies, right? In our area, Spat on shell, that means setting little baby oysters on, on shell and putting it out may not be effective. But in Pamlico, they don't have any larvae to speak of, so they're going to need that approach, right? Um, we've got to resolve some of these issues. Here's the, the short of it. We've got to, and I know everybody loves to put their oyster shells in their driveway, and you like to see it in your landscapers. You're killing us. Absolutely killing us. We cannot restore. They will not allow me to go to your house and dig up your driveway to put it to restore a reef. So have any of you seen one of these? Right? You go to a restaurant, you see the oyster shell recycling program. It still exists in North Carolina. This oyster shell recycling program uh, was one of the one of the issues that I got to deal with when I was an advisor on issues related to shellfish in North Carolina. Uh, it ran for a number of years. It, it's still operating today, but when it first started, the great state of North Carolina gave you a dollar tax credit for every bushel of shellfish you recycled, which meant if you owed the great state of North Carolina a dollar, you said, here's a bushel of oyster shell, they said, see ya. <laughs> and it was kind of an interesting win-win, right? Because at that point, I'm rolling back the clock, we were paying like a buck and a half for every bushel of shell. So if you brought us one, the state was saving money. And it, uh, there's some kind of economic multiplier you put in there because to collect tax dollars and, and to give it to somebody else costs money too. Well, that's gone away. And I'm not sure that we ever broke even on however many bushels of shell we recycled. I think the data that I saw was somewhere around 70 to 100,000 bushels of oyster shell. But it was one of the most fantastic education programs we've had. Uh, solid waste management groups all over the state were separating out the oyster shells. They were holding them for you, for us. All you had to do was show up and pick them up. Uh, restaurants got on board. So this was a great campaign. It allowed school groups to get involved. And guess what? This whole restoration thing, it's not just North Carolina. 
Um, this is actually out at Wrightsville Beach, so you go to the Coastal Fed and you see all that. This is actually in New York. They're doing a shallow water restoration. This is our barge uh, here in North Carolina, and this is a, a restored reef in Florida. All across the range, we are restoring oysters in all these water bodies. We're trying our best to get these guys back, mainly for the ecosystem services, certainly to support the fishery, but also because it's something that we have to do if we're going to maintain these ecosystems in, in a healthy way. So now, here's our cultural change problem. We've got to have this idea that we want this in our backyard, that we want this kind of, we want restoration and we want this kind of aquaculture and we're not afraid to have it in our backyard. Now, here's my caveat. If you go to Virginia's Marine Resources website, this is the first picture you see, right? If you read their website, it sounds like they are an aquaculture organization, oh yeah, and they manage a fishery, right? So I'm not sure that that's what we want. This is what it looks like in New England, by the way. This, is, this comes out of uh, one of the New England, uh, I, I think this may be Rhode Island, because uh, you were talking about Rhode Island earlier, but their only aquaculture operation is shellfish. So, so they don't have a fin fish uh, resource to compete with. And then maybe you want it to look like this, right? Maybe you want it to be subtitled and you don't want to see that. But we've got a lot of decisions we've got to make publicly, right? But we want, we've got to make some intentional decisions about what we want it to look like, one of these things that, that I, I have to say is very clear is that if the local population agrees, if you like, if you will go into a, a seafood house and you say, I would like a local shellfish, I would like a local oyster, I'd like something grown locally, they'll start carrying it. They'll try their best. Anybody ever go to Eagle Island? Seafood right, right there on 421? I went there the other day. There's eight different locations. They've got every area they've gotten oysters from. They're trying, if you tell them you want something from another place, they try their best to get it. They want to, to please their, their customers. So if you're asking for this, if you're asking for these local ones, it'll be easier for them to develop those markets, but it's also easier for us to protect the water quality. Because uh, as, as eloquent as Martin and Amy are, for 20 years we've said clean up the water, clean up the water, no one's listening to it. But if you can get these operations in the water, then you can get the regulations and you can begin to clean them up. One, because the oysters do a good job of it, but two, you'll have a business that you need to, to protect. Um, so, we've got something to help us cite these things. We created, uh, in our lab, we created a aquaculture citing tool. It was the question that we received the most from people that called us, where do I go get shellfish? How do I do this? Where do I get oysters? How can I? How can I uh, get, a, get started? So we helped the industry, we worked with the Division of Marine Fisheries, and we gathered all the information that we could possibly find, all the public data sets related to oyster aquaculture and water quality, all the things that the Division of Marine Fisheries would use to judge a site, and we put it in one place. You go right to our website, you click on the siting tool, and we were a little devious, we discovered that you all will not follow directions. <laughs> not one of you will follow directions. When we first put this tool out here, I said, there's a big disclaimer, it says it's not intuitive, right? You can't just simply sit down and run the tool, you'll have to do the tutorial. I got call after call, it's not working, it's not working. So what we did is we hit it. So you click on the tool, this little box comes up, that will take you directly to the tutorials. Once you click on the tutorials, you can drop right into the tool itself. You can go right there, you can open, you can open it up, there's a little box here that says content, you get that, you click on this little shellfish sighting tool, and there's 14 different data layers, you can turn them on and off. If you turn them all on, you won't be able to see anything. Okay, <laughs> what it takes. You have you zoom into any one of these areas. I like, I like zooming into the New River so that you can see uh, what's going on. Many of these data layers will not turn on until you're at a, at a relevant uh, spatial scale. And then you can look at, let's say you wanted to see SAV, you can see submerged aquatic vegetation. That is a regulatory conflict with aquaculture. So don't try to put your operation where you have sea grass. Uh, you can also look in there and you can see shellfish growing areas. So if it's green, that's good. If it's red, 
But that's bad. <laughs> Ours is simple, not like Virginia's. Red means you go anyway, right? So, <laughs> don't tell them I said that. Uh, but, but New River, great place. There's, there's about a dozen shellfish aquaculture operations in the lower New River. Most of these are extensive where they're simply putting out shell and harvesting it. You can look at all those other conflicts and you can see, now it's not a substitute for going out and actually getting in the water and, and, and verifying the site, but it is a great, great place to start to know where you shouldn't put your operation. Um, we get somewhere on the order of, I think we got our Google Analytics the other day, we get somewhere in the order of about 100 to 300 unique hits every month. I have no idea if that's good or not. Uh, we get a couple thousand repeats. Uh, I do follow all the little blogs, so the marine blogs where the guys talk about where they're fishing, they use our site a lot to find open enclosure areas and fishing areas, so, so we see that mentioned in there. Uh, we got a call from the National Marine Fishery Service that someone was citing our site uh, in one of their blogs about you know, what a great job the Division of Marine Fisheries had done. That's fine, we'll share credit. But, but we put it out here and it's constantly being updated. So the growers, uh, the users of the tool constantly call back and they say, hey, we want this piece of information. Here's an example of one that we got just two weeks ago. Uh, the Division of Fisheries said, hey, you know, we're a public trust state, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out in 1880, the state decided it didn't want to collect taxes to pay for schools and universities. It's a great idea. <laughs> so they gave all submerged lands to the Council of Literacy and Education. And they said, you can sell the submerged lands and raise your own money. And from 1880 to somewhere around 1950, they did just that. So while we are a public trust state, there are a lot of parcels of submerged land that are actually privately held. Now, it was stopped in, they didn't sell them after 19, 1955. And uh, I think, that, remember that six pages of legislation I talked about earlier, that's probably where some of that came from. I'm going to stop and Amy and, and uh, Martin will take all the questions you guys have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in full disclosure, indicate that actually our speaker for February will likely be coming from Virginia, uh, involved with the Virginia program, and so you can, you can kind of question him directly. 